Okay, so let's continue the discussion of optical flow methods. And now we have seen some of them that are model-based. Let's look at uh, those that are still, they have a model, but it's driven by data. So data-driven models. And a famous one, it's EVFlowNet. It's from 2018. The reference is on the bottom of the slide. Um, it's published in the RSS, Robotic Science and Systems Conference. Um, what's the idea? And the idea is uh, to learn flow from uh, from lots of data and trying to use conventional architectures, right? So here is uh, an architecture that has proven to be quite good. Uh, it's a unit. It's called a unit. It's like a our glass architecture that there is a, a bottleneck. So the, there is a part that it's an encoder and another one that it's a decoder and in kind of multi resolution stages and there are skip connections basically connecting the different layers and there are things that are measured so the the error with respect to ground truth or flow or some sort of uh, measure is um, is computed at different uh, resolutions or levels and then it's used to update all the coefficients of the network then the question is also what's what's the input right um, so this is um, the architecture, it's, uh, as we said, it's convolutional neural network, uh, conventional computer vision with UNET. And the input has four channels. And basically what they do is that they convert the events into uh, different images or channels mm -hmm. they're calling in um, conventional uh, computer vision. So a channel is basically a monochrome image. So four channels, or three channels, it would be like RGB, color image, red, green, and blue. For channels, it's a, it's a 3D array with uh, four in the in the third dimension. So what are these three channels or three images that are passed all together as a single uh, entity? Well, it's the, there are event frames. Basically, you count on every pixel, then the number of positive events, the number of negative events, and then also split by polarity, you compute the time surfaces. Uh, so uh, the on events and the off events, each of them, they generate the time surface. You get these four uh, images together as, as a 3D array and you pass it to the neural network. Um, the network itself supervised during training using intensity frames. So it requires frames from a co-located event camera, such as the, in the Davis to uh, provide a supervisory signal. And what is this supervisory signal? Basically, the network will predict or generate some flow. Uh, here, it's represented as U and V. And that flow is uh, used to warp, so to transform the next image, the image at time t plus 1, so that, in principle, we would like it to look like the image at time t. So the flow is used to warp the second frame into the first one. The error is measured, and this row is some sort of norm. So it could be the, the one norm or the different norm. In, in, the, in, in the paper, it's a Chabonier loss. And this is the data fidelity part. Then you also need to have some smoothness um, to, to guide the, the solution to the one that it's uh, plausible. Um, and that's the regularizer. So these frames are needed during training, but they are not needed during testing or inference. And basically at inference time, you just get the events, you convert them into these four channels representation, pass it through the network, and the network produces a flow. There is no need for frames anymore. And what is the output? It's a dense flow on all pixels, similar to what we've seen in this 2016 paper by Bardo. They, they were doing some variational um, uh, optimization and producing an, an op a dense optical flow. That's what we see on the right. So just to go through these images uh, or these different plots, the left is the image which is only used during training and all the uh, events during the images. Then in the middle, these events are just a representation of, of the events. It's uh, most likely the time surface. Uh, the ground truth of this data set, the optical flow, is provided by a LiDAR and a motion capture system in the room. So what we see colored here is using a color wheel, 
and uh, the strength of the flow is the, the saturation. Basically, it's the motion field, so this ground truth, we, we comment on it later. And the optical flow, it's uh, well, the flow produced by, by the network. This leads to some examples. So the, it's, this algorithm is trained and tested on the MVSEC multi-vehicle uh, multi stereo event camera data set on different sequences, not training and testing on the same sequence. And the ground truth is provided, as I said, by the motion field. So the depth is provided by a LiDAR. And the left is the input events, only one channel represented here. And in the middle is the estimated flow by the network. And the right is the ground truth. This is during daylight, even though it looks like dark, because we are only seeing the, the events. But we are not seeing the grayscale image. This is during daylight. And there are also results for, um, for night. This is indoors, uh, results indoors. You can see the, the boxes, the, the carpets, the walls. It's doing a reasonable job at estimating the flow. Okay, there are more, um, now there are more and more methods uh, coming up with uh, conventional neural networks applied to event-based data now that we know how to convert events into some grid representation and then pass this grid representation to a conventional neural network where we can play this game and try to use um, or design architectures to estimate optical flow so this is a different one where the input is not a four channel but a three channel what are these three channels is the event count of positive events the event count of negative events on a per pixel uh, those are the two here, and then an average timestamp per pixel. This is combined as a single three-channel input that it's passed to the network. What kind of architecture is there? Well, um, so the networks, there are two networks of evenly cascaded uh, design, so ECN, which are kind of uh, small networks, lightweight with many connections. And one network is it, it takes, for example, five of these three channels input, so space in time. Um, so the, here you can see, here it's represented with three. If you had um, three of these input channels, at time t, t plus one, t minus one, then you can use one network to estimate the pose and another network that uses the middle slice to estimate the depth. So one estimates the ego motion of uh, the camera and the other one estimates uh, the depth. Um, and then you combine these two to within what we know the equations of the motion field, something that we have uh, seen in previous videos to estimate the flow. And then basically you warp um, the slices uh, according to this optical flow and measure the, the error between uh, these uh, warp slices using the flow. And in that sense, it's um, it's unsupervised. There is no need for frames. You're just using the events and using the photometric consistency between the edges. You basically want the edge information when it's warped by the flow to be consistent with the edge information when it was not warped by the flow in, in a different time. And the output are, well, you can have the output of the network. So def for every pixel that's here in the middle, the ego motion, so the pose, which is here on the right. And if you combine the def and the ego motion, then you can compute the optical flow or as we better know, the motion field. So this is a network that is kind of learning structure from motion and from learning structure, which it means 3D def and motion, camera motion, it combines both to estimate uh, optical flow. Let's look at some results. So here there are, on every row, it's a different sequence from the MVSEC dataset, indoor, outdoor day, outdoor night, indoor flying, and you see the input representation on the leftmost column, and then it's comparing the flow, the one produced by the network and the ground truth, and the same for, for the depth the estimated by the network and the ground truth depth. 
it also compares with uh, EV flow net so and with other methods to show on accuracy that's one of the metrics that is used and it also computes some depth estimation metrics to show that it's doing a reliable job <coughs> at estimating depth finally in eagle motion estimation what you can do is that you can integrate the velocities est um, estimated by the method and that will give you a trajectory and then you can compare the trajectory with the ground truth trajectory provided for example by gps and there is some drift uh, but overall it, it looks reasonable okay there is uh, another network more or less that came at the same time on unsupervised optical flow or depth <laughs> So these are actually two networks, one that computes optical flow and another one that estimates depth and motion, so structure from motion for short. And uh, it's uh, uh, kind of same principle as EV FlowNet by the same author. Uh, it's a unit, the architecture with, uh, so there is an encoder and then a decoder with skip connections. And that's the flow one. And in, in case there is the, the one that is estimating depth and motion, the uh, the decoder will estimate the, the depth and then there will be an intermediate network here at the bottleneck that will also estimate the, the motion. And now the input has changed instead of being a four channel input, so the count of events, positive events, negative events, time surface for positive events and time surface for negative events, now it's a voxel grid which tries to better preserve the temporal characteristics of the, of the events. This interpolated voxel grid is something that we have uh, seen in the exercises. And uh, what is being optimized? Uh, well, a motion compensation loss. So trying to kind of <coughs> um, de-blur, if we could call it, the edges using uh, time, time maps. Uh, let's see some of the results. Um, so on the left, the images, just to show them, and then the, the events uh, on two sequences in the MVSEC dataset, and then uh, the ground truth optical flow, ground truth flow velocity on the right, and then the estimated optical flow, it's in the middle. And it's doing a reasonable job. Let's look at, at the video. So the events are converted first as an input representation into a voxel grid. And this is what it's trying to be minimized. You're trying to minimize the so-called motion blur. Basically, what it's trying to do is try to compensate, uh, trying to find motion compensated images, so that this this the blurred event image is called uh, the motion compensated one. And it's doing it uh, using a, a dense flow field. Uh, on the bottom right is the ground truth, then in the middle is the, the flow predicted by the network, and for comparison on the left is EV flow net. And this is the result of uh, an, another network that instead of estimating flow, it's uh, estimating the, predicting the depth. It's using the similar architecture. So the, the method generalizes, and you can see this is a feature spinner uh, very fast, and it can estimate optical flow, or at least colored or reasonable uh, color optical flow. There is no ground truth for that that can be compared. Yeah, so there are more, more sequences. Uh, this is just to show that the method, even though it has been trained on, on some data, uh, it can generalize to some other scenes. In this example, for example, water it's overexposed in the frames is difficult to see, but it's more easier to see on the on the events. This is just qualitative results, therefore there is no ground truth. But it works. Uh, it works uh, very very well. Okay, so we have talked about uh, neural networks that kind of follow conventional architectures. Um, so trying to adapt frame-based uh, computer vision, basically the events are converted from points or spikes into some grid representation and then passed to a neural network. A different approach is that one that it's 
trying to preserve the spikes or event base um, uh, not only at the input but also through the processing. So what is a spiking neural network or SNN? A spiking neural network is a computational model by which uh, you input a signal that it's a spike base or event base. Uh, so it's uh, it's not an image, it's like uh, something trying to mimic uh, the the architecture of how it's working, uh, the processing in the brain. And this uh, neural network consists of typically several layers in a hierarchical structure, and each layer has different neurons. So these are artificial neurons that have some membrane potential, so they are mimicking the neurons in the, in the human visual system and um, they receive some inputs which is a spike base then these inputs are being processed and accumulated they affect the membrane potential and when the membrane pot potential achieves some threshold when it crosses some threshold then it spikes some output and then there is a refractory period by which uh, over which the, the neuron is not responding so it's basically a, a spike based computational unit so this is one neuron and then you will have on every layer there should be uh, many neurons and they this process processing basically happens asynchronously as the spikes go through the different layers they communicate and the information is in the in the timing of the of the events um, and this could be in principle it could be very fast right instead of having like a convolutional neural network where processing happens on a per layer and in, they are uh, waiting for all the inputs to be available, compute, and then pass to the next layer. Instead, in spike neural networks, um, information or the signals are continuous. So what it happens is that uh, as the spike comes, they are being processed and accumulated and affecting the membrane potentials. And they also are kind of continuous in time. And then at some point, they spike and they uh, affect the next layer and so on. But there is no kind of synchronous clock affecting them. These changes could happen at any point in time. So it's an asynchronous processing, trying to mimic the, the processing in the human brain. What's the idea of, uh, for example, this new spiking neural network that is presented in this 2013 paper? paper? Um, well, the idea is to detect a particular flow, direction, and speed uh, by coincidence detection of events at a neuron. What do we mean? So imagine we have an edge, this vertical edge, and it's going to cross uh, five pixels. And this neuron is observing what happens in these five pixels. So what we could do is that as the edge is passing through this pixeling and triggering some changes, we could have a different delay for every pixel. These five pixels are connected to the neuron so that the changes are communicated to the neuron at the same time and therefore this will increase the membrane potential and it will spike uh, will create a, a spike that's kind of represented in the following video so the edge is moving it's triggering the pixels and these are the different delays and they all arrive to the neuron at the same time and then generate a spike so the neurons are basically acting as a coincidence detection using delays. The synapses, which are the connections between the neurons, are um, producing delays. Basically, we treat pixels as being also neurons in a previous layer or in the input layer. The, the output of these pixels are the events. Um, so if you have 64 neurons, so if you want to detect eight different directions and eight different magnitudes of the, of the flow, so the speeds, then in total you would be able to uh, detect 64 possible uh, flow vectors. And that's what it's represented in these experiments. And the, the synapses, basically this spiking neural network, it's manually set. So you choose uh, the the values of the network so that you are able to detect 20 pixels per second 90 pixels per second to 190 pixels per second and the eight different directions what we see on the top right are the input events uh, top left are the grayscale video 
just for visualization it's not being used and on the bottom you see the the direction so these colors are the eight different directions and the, the speed as the cars go through this highway intersection or bridge um, and this, this video you can find in the, in the youtube link below basically this is uh, it the the algorithm is detecting uh, how the cars move and it's yeah computing the flow and now we are basically representing the two components of the flow the direction and the magnitude so this is a, a, a model that it's uh, biologically inspired in trying to do a coincidence detection and then there are also there is also a different or another uh, spike in neural network that it's hierarchical and this is more recent from uh, 2019 appeared in PAMI and uh, this is a feed-forward spike in neural network where the inputs are the events then they have a single synaptic convolutional layer uh, and then a multi synaptic uh, convolutional layer a pooling and a dense layer um, in this case the connections are learned instead of being manually set they are learned in principle from the input uh, in a kind of unsupervised way and the result of this uh, training or learning these connections with a new learning uh, model or STTP um, is the, um, that the, the resulting network has uh, biological properties uh, such as feature extraction that happens more or less in this layer um, and the local and global motion perception which happens the local one in this MS uh, comp layer and the global motion in the dense one and this is all done in software it's not really implemented in hardware even though spiking neural networks are amenable to be implemented in uh, neuromorphic hardware uh, some of the results if you have this input events this is the result of this middle layer that it's doing feature extraction and the merge layer and basically the ms comp is the subsample but this is layer that is giving you optical flow and for comparison um, on the right it's the result of EV flow net and this is basically uh, one of the data sets um, from a 2016 paper where you have like a rotating uh, disk with different brightness steps and there is also a video with some uh, uh, results uh, first it analyzes the the result of this single synaptic convolutional layer that it's basically showing how the the filters are or the weights are learned from from these inputs there are some responses are then it's trying to uh, the training is learning the the weights so it's actually learning direction selectivity these are five by five there were five by five pixel filters and these are the results of processing in the through this SNN some different uh, events. Um, th these are different layers of the feature extraction and the local motion perception. So this is the kind of the optical flow. This is on a textured carpet. Um, then there is another example that it's a bit more less textured and a bit more realistic I would say well this is still boxes from the IGR 2017 data set on the motion so the network is also doing a subsampling that's why we see that the resolution is higher on the left than on the right it's doing some pooling and therefore we see a smaller resolution on the right than on the left and this is a scene, maybe a more natural or realistic scene. Yeah, the results look uh, reasonable. Okay, uh, that's basically it for the uh, learning-based methods. And now, how do they, how do the methods compare? Is there a way? We've seen that sometimes when the methods are uh, presented, they are compared to with some other previous methods 
The thing is that it's difficult to tell because there is a lack of comparison benchmark. This is something that we already talked uh, before. There is a comparison 2016 done by Toby Delbrook and Bodo uh, Rookauer at Frontiers of Neuroscience. Um, but there have been many developments since 2016, so this kind of comparison is a bit old now. The de facto standard now is to compare to uh, previous methods um, using the MVSEC dataset because this is a dataset where ground truth is provided by uh, the motion field obtained by SLAM or motion capture system plus the LiDAR that provides the depth. Um, there is, yeah, and so basically this is a data set that has ground truth flow. There are not that many data sets that have or where you can compute ground truth flow. And uh, this is an example of one of the, the tables when you, if you want to compare to other methods from CVPR 2019. On the columns are the different sequences, indoor, flying, outdoor day, and on the rows are the, the methods. Um, so I think you have to just take these numbers with a grain of salt. They are kind of there to compare uh, accuracy, but uh, there a more thorough comparison. I think it's is required to get really get a feeling of how the methods compare because this is just comparing on, on a few sequences, and there are many parameters to tune on each method and so on. This is just uh, to get a ballpark. So what is this 2016 comparison? Let me show a video of it. So they are nicely comparing more or less nine algorithms, four variations of the Lucas Canada method, four variations of the plane fitting that we've seen, and one is the direction selective method compared against IMU flow, which is the ground truth coming from the, from the IMU. So optical flow or motion is obtained by rotating the camera. The problem with that is that it uh, lacks parallax. There is no occlusion disocclusions. This was the direction selective filter. Now it's the Lucas Canada flow. You see quite nicely the colors uh, representing the direction. Um, and then there are yes variants without refractory fi uh, filter and uh, yeah, it's trying to do like a more thorough analysis of this basically. Uh, three methods is the direction selective and then the, the Lucas Canade and the plane fitting with four different variations. This is a more natural scene where the, the camera is rotating around the um, vertical axis. This is the IMU flow. So the flow from the IMU, this is one algorithm, direction selective flow. And then it's compared to Lucas Canade. This is a nice kind of uh, comparison the problem here was to compute uh, ground truth uh, flow, and this basically came from uh, from the IMU. Okay, so um, what are the references for this uh, whole optical flow uh, sequence uh, series of videos? Uh, well, I encourage you to read section 4.2 of Event-Based Vision, a survey, the survey paper, and the to also take a look at the papers reference at the bottom of uh, each slide. And in, if you want to know more about uh, optical flow, uh, I encourage you to take a look at uh, summary or reviews of optical flow methods, such as in Scholarpedia or this chapter of, of a book. And um, I think that's it. Thank you very much.